how people suffer has an effect on other people. Um, if you remember the 2011 tsunami that nailed Japan along with a couple of earthquakes and resulted in the uh, Fukushima incident where a nuclear plant was hit and nasty business that. Um, there was these images of orderly rows of Japanese people who had been affected at ground zero, actual victims of the catastrophe, uh, afterwards marching in neat rows to presumably assembly points where they'd be, um, where there would be some sort of roll call or whatever and people would report the missing, whatever. It was it was amazing to watch how quickly the Japanese society adapted to the catastrophe and how there was no panic, no breakdown, no nothing, no lunatics, um, you know, filling their trucks with guns and canned food and heading for the hills or whatever. The Japanese people simply had a plan for this contingency plan and they just went with their plan. Um, and these people had just seen scenes that most people would never want to see in their entire life. You know, people being drowned, demolished, killed, whatever, you know, just obliterated uh, buildings, that sort of thing. And stoically, they just did as they'd been trained to do. Um, what effect did that have on you when you saw that? I think it kind of took the world's breath away. I haven't spent a lot of time in Japan, but I've been there. And one of the things that kind of amazes people who go there is just how, I don't know, how efficient the system is that the Japanese live under. Um, and how it's almost creepy in, in its sort of all-encompassing nature. It It's not just a series of plans and everything put into place. There's a mentality behind it, the Japanese mindset. Um, Japanese people don't have to be convinced or browbeaten into reacting like this. It just seems to come out of their culture. If the authorities say, do it this way, then that's what happens. Um, and it's not blind obedience either, because the Japanese have a democracy that's as real as anything in you know, the rest of the West. Um, but again, what effect did this have? The fact that these people were sort of submitting themselves to a larger process in the midst of the most trying circumstances imaginable. Um, well, I would say that one of the main sort of subconscious reactions for non-Japanese people, in particular, say, people in the English-speaking world where we're so individualistic, was astonishment, admiration mixed with a bit of creepiness. Um, how can they do this? But you can't help but admire them for it. Um, these people get enormous respect, kudos for having done this. Why? Because, I'm, in, advertently or not, I'm not an expert on Japanese culture or anything, they gained enormous respect in the world by the way they reacted. Now, I tend to err on the side of, well, they, they simply are like this, and they don't really see it as such a big deal. It's just, this is what we are as Japanese people. You shouldn't be astonished by something simply being what it is. It doesn't make us gods or anything. It's, you know, there's, I'm sure there are Japanese people who, say, who would say there's a big downside to this stoicism. Um, is you you know you tend to just deal with things that maybe would be better if you sort of did actually um, revolt like in the Second World War they kind of did the same thing um, when they were their country was being blasted into rubble uh, they just stoically endured it all and a lot of people say maybe they really should have you know revolted on mass and told the military leaders who were leading their country to absolute disaster that wait a minute, you really shouldn't do this. Um, and I think that that's one of the reasons why the Japanese didn't quite blow their own horns to the point where um, we're actually 
superior and here's how you actually do deal with a disaster. I think Japanese people are sort of self-reflective enough to know that there's a downside to this ability to not lose your head in horrible circumstances. But the world was amazed anyway by these columns of Japanese people who had just been through hell marching um, off to wherever they were going, I guess, as I say, assembly points. How did they do that? Um, I would say that Japanese people, as such, have... They, they In cases like that, they have expressed a sort of what looks for all the world like an inner strength that other people might not have. The ability to stay calm while bullets are whizzing past your head, or at least look calm while this is happening. Um, and to act calm, to seize control of yourself in moments like this, and act very stoically. If you can do that, I would argue, you would have enormous power over other people. It would, it would increase your prestige or your charisma, if you want to look at it that way, to the point where people are more likely to pay attention to you, are more likely to um, look up to you and give you some sort of authority in terms of dealing with things when they seriously go wrong. Now that's power. Now again, I don't believe the Japanese did this on purpose. I think it's simply what the Japanese people are. They react this way, their, their entire history has made them this way. Uh, it, what for us looks like enormous courage and fortitude is simply a knee-jerk reaction from Japanese culture. I'm not trying to downplay it, but I don't want to overblow it either. But it did have an effect. People were astonished. In horrible circumstances, the Japanese didn't even blink. Um, that's going to have an effect on people who see it. As I say, it might even give you the creeps. Like, what is the matter with you people? You're going through hell here, and humans are supposed to react some way. They probably reacted in their own way, in a very Japanese way. Um, but in the meantime, in the heat of battle, as it were, they soldiered on. Um, <clears throat> When you're wounded and left on Afghanistan's plains and the women come out to cut up what remains, just roll to your rifle and blow out your brains and go to your god like a soldier. Same thing. Um, wow. Impressive. Now, what is it in humans that causes us to look up to this? Um... There are many, many, many different angles. As I say, the Japanese, I don't believe they did it on purpose, but you could do it on purpose in order to provoke a response from people you know are watching. Uh, there's a famous uh, story in France of Charles de Gaulle when Paris was being liberated. They had a mass in uh, Notre Dame, in central Paris, and uh, there were snipers in the cathedral while it was taking place, and during the Mass, um, some gunfire broke out in the church, and with the bullets whizzing around, Charles de Gaulle, all six foot seven of him, or whatever, I know he was usually head and shoulders taller than everybody else, I don't know what his actual height was, stood up in full uniform, walked to the front of the, um, of the cathedral, and calmly stuck his tongue out, waiting for the, I guess, the archbishop to put the communion host on his tongue, while everybody else was kind of groveling on the floor. And here's de Gaulle acting as though nothing was happening. And they said from that moment on, I think it was an American journalist said it, uh, from that moment on, Charles de Gaulle had France in the palm of his hand. Um, he's in terrible danger, and he simply ignores it. Um, how do you... How do you explain that, that power that people who do this have? Um, the psychological power. 
the British thin red line in um, traditional military sort of folklore. Not not very many soldiers dressed up in red with their uh, weapons in neat ranks while whatever enemy it is is charging right into their face and they just stand there as though nothing is going to happen. They're ignoring the people who are attacking them. And then at a sharp command, wham! They all point their rifles, muskets, whatever at the enemy, wait for another sharp command that says fire, and at the exactly correct moment, they fire. Um, and then, methodically, again, seemingly ignoring the storm that's about to break over them, they calmly load their muskets, wait for the order. It doesn't matter what's going on around them. They've been disciplined to the point where they're going to just listen to whatever the orders are. And um, fire again, or fix bayonets, or whatever it is. That The thin red line is a sort of a image in military folklore. Now that's kind of it's, it's impressive, but what I like to do is I like to look at it from the point of view of the person who's attacking that thin red line. What's that going to do to you? When you're charging at these British soldiers, screaming, maybe brass bands blaring, uh, you're taking pot shots, you're, you know, ha 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 ha, we're going to get you, you know, this kind of thing, and the British are just standing there waiting for orders. from And, and once the order is given, it's carried out immediately, with deadly effect. What effect does this have on people who are attacking the thin red line? Breaks your nerve. It makes you think, who the hell are these people I'm fighting? Aren't, aren't they even people? Um, <clears throat> Again, most of this, if you ask me, is psychological. You're just demonstrating a supposed indifference to the danger around you. Now, this is deliberate. This, I'm sure, is a psychological weapon used against an enemy. It's as though the Japanese had actually done this on purpose, acted so orderly in, after a tsunami, because they knew the cameras were rolling and they wanted to impress the world. This is kind of the psychology behind the thin red line. The British knew the effect that being this disciplined, this repressed almost, this overtly calm in the face of mayhem has an enormous effect on the people you're fighting and it could break their nerve and they would, it may be in some way they would admire you for being this way. Um, it's all down to how you deal with things like suffering, danger, panic, whatever. Um, part of us admires strength enormously and to us the Japanese at Fukushima and the thin red line and all that other stuff that looks an awful lot like enormous inner strength which can be used as they say like the force for good or for bad but it is a strength, and it's a very subtle strength, but it's overwhelming. Think of guilt trips. Think of um, deliberately um, making a martyr of yourself, Christians thrown to the lions, this sort of thing, and showing an enormous capacity to suffer. That can be used offensively as well as defensively. Um, it can be done on purpose to achieve a desired result. You ever had a person in your family with a martyr complex? You'll know what I mean. This, I think, may be inherent in us. A lot of people say that the martyr is actually showing you how moral he or she is by enduring all of this. I think it's different. I think the martyr is showing you how powerful he or she is, completely in control of his or her reactions in every possible way and in the most trying of circumstances, the most terrifying of circumstances. 
that's power, isn't it? That's power far more than having, you know, an office or a title or um, a rank. I'll go back to Gandhi. The, the first scene in Gandhi, the uh, Martin Sheen plays an American reporter. He said he commanded no armies, he had no office, he wasn't a king, an emperor, or anything, but he had power more absolute than, you know, the most powerful dictator. And it was a power that was so absolute that the people he was exerting it over didn't even know it.